Told in the Train by Lady Napier of Magdala Published in the Cardiff Evening Express on the 9th of May 1910 Read by Bethina Two men sat opposite each other, sole occupants of a third-class carriage in the afternoon express to the west of England. Artists, apparently, judging by the character of impedimenta crowding the racks. Typical painters, too, bushy of beard, soft of hat, easy of clothing, observant of eye. One considerably senior to the other. Brown and Jones, we will call them. It was early summer time and the country was a dream of delicate beauty and fresh greenery, the sky an exquisite turquoise blue. Both men smoked in silence, deepest satisfaction beaming from their countenances as they revelled in the beauty and freshness of the scene as the train rolled smoothly on its way. Afternoon was drawing towards evening. "'What a wonderful old house, Brown! Do look!' exclaimed the younger man. "'Its windows are all blood-red in the setting sun. "'Did you ever see such a delightful place? "'Look at the gables. "'I suppose it is one of my Lord Tom Noddy's seats "'that he don't sit in, confound him. "'Do you know anything about it? "'You know these parts so well.' "'Brown hesitated. "'Yes, I know it. "'I have good cause to know it. It is an accursed place. It cost me the life of one of the dearest of my friends and one of the most rising painters of the day. You would hardly remember poor Charlie Shaw Jones. He was before your time. No, but I have heard a lot about his work, though, said Jones. It was splendid. I have seen some of it. Brown sighed heavily and lit another pipe. I suppose it is all for the best in this best of all possible worlds, he said. But I do grudge Charlie Shaw. Do you mind telling me about it? said Jones, all agog with curiosity. That is to say, if you do not mind talking about it. No, my boy, but I must ask you not to let it go any further. This is what happened. A good many years ago, Charlie Shaw and I were flying westwards to paint, much as you and I are doing now. It was death on apple orchards in those days and he found the material he liked to work from also in the West. He was a dreamy sort of fellow. He would roam round a place sometimes for weeks together before he would settle to any serious work. But when once he began, he was a cross between a tiger and a bear with a sore head. He was nailed to his business, so to speak. However, all this won't interest you. We took up our quarters that time at a charming little inn in the neighbourhood of that infernal house we have just passed. Worst luck. It was lovely weather and I found exactly what I wanted in the way of subject at once and started work. I saw little of Charlie Shaw, who, I supposed, was as usual wandering around. I was working hard one evening when he came to me. Johnny, he said, you are missing the most wonderful thing I have ever seen in the way of old buildings. It is a painter's dream. I have been there every day since we came here. Do come and see it. I always did what old Charlie wanted me to do somehow, so I cleaned up my palette and we started off to see that same house. It certainly was wonderful. Such colour, such gables, such yew hedges and weird old leaden statues in dim corners. Such an air of decay and unspeakable gloom were on that lovely summer's evening. A silence that could be felt seemed to brood over the place. Moss-grown steps ran up to the hall door. A long iron bell pull with wrought metal handle hung at the side. The paint was dropping away from the woodwork in strips. Unwholesome-looking lichens clung to the stone. Charlie Shaw sprang up the steps and rang a peal at the bell, much to my dismay. "'Oh, no one comes,' he said. "'I ring every day. I would not miss it for worlds.' Did you ever hear anything so weird as the echoes? Listen. I am not a nervous man, but I can tell you that the sound of that hall bell creaking, clanging and echoing through that empty house gave on my nerves, as the French say, and there was something about the whole place that gave me the creeps. The empty stables, the empty dog kennels. 
It was as though death reigned over the whole thing. I could hardly get Charlie away, however. If I had not been so busy at this time, I should have been rather anxious about him, for this hateful place appeared to be taking a sort of possession of him, and at last I did not like to ask him where he had been during the day. He seemed rather to resent it. Of work he did none. We had been established at the little inn for some weeks when he hunted me up one afternoon in my apple orchard, his eyes blazing with excitement. "'I have found out all about the manor house,' he said. "'It has an evil reputation and is supposed to be haunted. "'It has such a bad name that the owners never come near it. "'I have always longed to see a ghost, dear old Johnny, "'and I want you to come with me and sit up in the haunted room and see what happens. "'I feel convinced we shall see something.' I have been to the agent of the family to whom it belongs, he lives in the country town here, and he has given me leave. I pretended we might take the house. They are dead keen to let it. It has remained empty so long, and I gather that owing to its bad name they would jump at anyone to let or sell it to. You must come. I have ordered some firewood in and packets of candles, and we will go up there tonight after dinner and see what happens. As I told you before, I always did what Charlie Shaw asked me to do, so sorely against the grain I started off with him after our comfortable dinner at the inn. The manor house looked still more forbidding in the gloaming. The brooding silence, the smell of damp and decay, the bats squeaking and flying about. Charlie drew the key of the front door from his pocket, a large key of wrought iron work, like that on the bell pull. The bolt shot back with a creaking sound that echoed through the house. A musty smell of decay floated out into the summer air. There was a square entrance hall, a billiard table at one side, the cloth in strips and soaking with damp, portraits mildewed and some in rags hung on the wall. A wide, shallow step staircase led out of the hall to the landing above. Charlie ran up it two steps at a time and flung open the door. This is the room where the ghost is supposed to appear, he shouted in his ringing voice, and there is her portrait over the fireplace. It was a long gallery, in the same state of disrepair as was the rest of the house. Several doors opened into it. A heavy old-fashioned writing table and a few chairs were all the furniture it boasted. Come and look at the portrait, said Charlie impatiently. It was the portrait of a woman, with a black coif on her powdered hair, pale, cold eyes, aquiline nose and thin, cruel mouth. The eyes seemed to follow you about in an unpleasant manner, as is the way with some portraits. Mr Carr, the agent, said it was nonsense about there being a ghost, said Charlie. He wanted me to take the place off his hands at a nominal rent just to get it aired. He said it's being so out of the way and this not being so fashionable a neighbourhood as it once was was the only reason against his letting. But I said I must insist on sleeping in the haunted room for a night before I did anything else. I got out of him that the portrait we are looking at is the portrait of the ghost, but he treated it as a joke. Mrs Evans at the inn had told me about it. A good supply of firewood was stacked by the fireplace and the fire laid, requiring only the match, promptly applied by me. We stuck candles into all the candlesticks we could find, old Sheffield plate most of them, battered but still beautiful in shape and workmanship. Charlie drew up two chairs to the fire, now roaring up the chimney. We lit our pipes, and I think we both felt rather asses. It was pitch dark outside, though the moon would rise later, and the owls hooted and shrieked eerily. I was dog-tired. I had been working double tides at my apple blossom from morn till eve, and I could hardly keep my eyes open. I must have given a heavy lurch nearly into the fire once, for Charlie seized me just in time to save me. "'Look here, old chap,' he said. "'It is really rather rough on you. Go and lie down. "'There is a bed and a good supply of blankets in a room leading out of this. "'Lie down and I will give you a hello when the ghost appears. "'That door over there.' "'I must tell you that I did not really believe in ghosts, "'so I gladly did as he suggested, "'stretching my weary limbs on the bed, "'rolling myself comfortably in the blankets, "'and almost before my head touched the pillow, I was asleep.' How long I slept I know not. 
Something aroused me and I was as broad awake as ever I was in my life. I sprang to the floor and rushed to the door of my room, which had been left open, and stood rooted on the threshold. Charlie was standing by the fireplace, his eyes fixed on the door at the end of the gallery, which was slowly opening. An icy breath waved through the room, making the candles wink. Then a silent procession of figures passed through the doorway. A woman, the woman of the portrait, there was no mistaking her. Her hand grasped the shoulder of a sullen-looking youth, not for support. There was no need for support in that haughty, upright figure. She seemed to be propelling him forward. Two white-haired old men dressed like Hogarth's lawyers, one carrying what looked like parchment deeds and a black bag, followed the woman and her son into the room, distress on their faces and in the gesture of their upraised hands. The woman pushed the youth onwards towards the writing table and forced him into a chair, beckoning imperiously to the old man to approach. Taking the paper from the hand of his colleague, the old lawyer spread it out on the table before the youth, and with shaking hands, pressed together, appeared to murmur in his ear. The woman broke in with impatient gesture, and the old man with trembling finger pointed to the place where the deed was to be signed. The youth gazed stupidly at the paper, making no attempt to take the pen which was held out to him. Suddenly he rose to his feet and with a gesture of fury tore the deed across and across and flung it from him. An awful expression came across his mother's face. The fires of hell blazed in her eyes. Seizing a heavy paper weight lying on the table, she struck him on the head with it with all her force. He fell dead at her feet and the old men with their hands raised to heaven hurried from the room. The woman stood as though carved in stone. Charlie, his face as the face of the dead, tried to leave the room. She turned and saw him and with menacing gesture advanced towards him. With a shriek of horror that still rings in my ears, he fell face forward on the ground and the whole scene vanished. He and I were alone. I rushed to Charlie. It was long before he recovered from his swoon and I could get him back to the inn. Once there, he took to his bed. Brain fever set in and he hovered between life and death for many weeks. He never really recovered his health, but died about two years afterwards. Poor dear old Charlie. After his death, poor dear fellow, I never rested or left one stone unturned in order to find out the meaning of the horror we had seen. A difficult job, but time and money accomplished it. The woman, or rather the fiend, that we had both seen was the widow of a former proprietor of the manor house, a great beauty in her day, and gossip had it as bad as beautiful. She had married her husband in order to screen herself from the consequences of an escapade that would have put her beyond the pale of society, even in those lax days. Bewildered by her beauty, she turned her husband round her finger, but he found her out in course of time, and some said that it was by no accident that he came by his death after some years of wedded life. Two sons were born of the marriage, the eldest, the heir to his father's name and estates, a gentle creature, backward and nervous, and some said wanting. This, his father, his people and dependents would never allow. All adored him for his gentleness, his kindness, his passionate love of animals, and strange were the pets harboured by many a poor dependent for the young heir. His love for his home was a passion. All the affection of his tender nature, denied other outlet, seemed to concentrate on the home of his father's, and he would listen by the hour to tales and legends treasured up by some of the old people on the estate connected with the doings of his race. His mother's feeling for him was one of cold dislike verging on hatred as he filled the place that would otherwise have been occupied by his brother on whom she expended the whole force of an adoration savage and unbalanced in its intensity. Utterly unworthy was the object of this maternal passion. Vicious and self-indulgent from childhood, his life was given up to the basest pleasures and to the excitements of gambling. 
In those days, people did much as they liked, and trustees troubled themselves but little with their trusts. After her husband's death, the woman seized the reins of power as regarded the management of the estate, and slice after slice had been cut off to satisfy the increasing demands of the younger son. The elder came to man's estate. His signature was absolutely necessary for the last call, however, which meant the passing of the manor house and what remained of the once fair heritage to strangers. We have seen what happened, and the hideous scene is apparently re-enacted nightly in the same place. The woman, however, little knew when she struck the blow that laid her son dead at her feet, that the blow had left her childless and a beggar, her other son had fallen, but a few hours earlier, in a duel, in a cause worthy of the life he laid down. The heir at law swooped down on the scene. He laughed the idea of debts of honour to scorn. The woman was handed over to be dealt with by the strong arm of the law and expiated her crimes on the scaffold. That was Told in the Train by Eva Maria Louisa Napier. She was born in 1846 and died in 1930. She wrote romantic melodramatic novels in the first two decades of the 20th century. And as far as I know, this is her only ghost story. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please remember to click the like button and subscribe for more lesser known ghost stories. And as always, thank you for listening.